Midwest Sports Radio, 1140, a radio.com station. The most in-depth coverage of the silver and black as they set their sights on Las Vegas for 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio, 1140 studios, it's silver and black today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. Now, here's Scott Gilbranson and Matt Gutierrez. All right, good morning, Las Vegas. Good morning, world. If you're streaming us on the radio.com app, thank you, or watching us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, where you can also see the show. Thanks for joining us here on the Silver and Black today. CBS Sports Radio 1140 Las Vegas is only all Raiders talk show. While others in the Valley dabble in the Raiders, that's all we do here. We're coming to you live from the Dollar Loan Center, don'tbebroke.com studios. I am your host, Scott Colbranser. Colbranser. Colbranson. Hello. New, new name. <laughs> Founder and publisher of SilverBlackToday.com, joined by my co-host Matt Gutierrez. How's it going, Matty? Good, man. I, I think I think you know when you've hit it big time. <laughs> this morning, oh. this morning I hit it big time, man. What happened? I realized I realized just just where we're at now. AFL Godfather is trolling me on Twitter. He's trolling you. Uh oh, what do he do? He sent out a little happy birthday to Doug Martin, <laughs> and he tagged me in the damn photo, man. Can oh, you believe that? That's funny. He, I couldn't believe it. You he, guys and your Doug Martin love. He, no, he, that's he, that's funny. I, I, it was a good thing to wake up to. I was laughing when I saw that this morning. He is a gem, and uh, Raider fans on Twitter know exactly who we're talking about because he's uh, the the Twitter historian uh, for Raider Nation, and we love him, so we give him a shout out uh, when we can. So reminder again, we're streaming today's worldwide uh, on the radio.com app. Also, stream the show live video. Uh, on our YouTube channel, where there's always some cool discussion happening uh, as well. If you're more into Facebook, you can watch us there, too. Uh, we are live there as well. Um, you can also do it on Twitter. So if you follow our Twitter handle, which is at SilverBlackToday, the number two day, um, we're live there as well. So no matter where you, you are, you can find us and you can see us uh, live in the studio here. Uh, as always, check out the website as well, serverandblacktoday.com. Uh, that's what started it all, got us where we're at. We cover the Raiders like no other place in Las Vegas, so make sure you head over to silverandblacktoday.com. It's a busy day in the NFL. We're going to touch uh, on some overall news in the league and look back at yesterday's games. Uh, but here's a look at today's show. Just want to give you a quick rundown, Maddie, as we as we think about what we got going. It might be the offseason for the Raiders, man, but we never stop. I mean, yep. we just don't. Why bother? Exactly. It's football, man. It's twenty. It's 12 months a year. 24 hours a day. I don't care what anybody says. In the first hour, our good friend Gilbert Manzano. If you remember Gilbert from the Review Journal here in Las Vegas, used to cover the Raiders. Now he is the beat writer covering the Los Angeles Chargers for the Orange County Register. He'll be with us live from Gillette Stadium in Foxborough as the Chargers get set to take on Tom Brady and the Patriots. Join us every oh, Sunday at 8 a.m. for so Silver and Black today, on. only on uh, CBS Sports hold Radio. On for a sec, folks. Thanks, David. Uh, but we will have Gilbert on right before kickoff, so he'll uh, give us a skinny on what's happening there with the with the Chargers and the Patriots. So stay tuned for that. Also, this hour is the sport, sports talk sage of San Diego, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Hamilton will be with us for a special report on the latest rumors coming out of San Diego uh, about uh, the Raiders playing in America's finest city for 2019. Reports indicate there have been conversation there matt but you know what the mayor's office has denied it of course so well, i we'll, mean we'll talk about that been, yeah we we got to talk to lee about that because the the san diego thing has has come and gone more than once already now so yeah. it's man these stadiums that you you get one that pops up with a rumor and then it disappears another one pops up and it disappears um you we've been we've been pretty steady with san antonio we've stayed on that one for a while now um and it's it's been kind of quiet on the San Antonio front, but it's not one that they've said, yeah, it's absolutely happening, or no, it's completely died. And that makes me think maybe they are leaning in that direction a little bit. Well, yeah, and we'll talk about it because we we actually took a poll yesterday, and so we're gonna we're gonna talk to Lee about that. We'll also get Lee's comments uh, and view of the playoffs as well, uh, because Lee has been a longtime voice of the NFL and covered the NFL for a long time, so we'll ask him about that as well. Uh, also, this hour, excuse me, we'll close out the hour by dialing up senior NFL analyst for silverandblacktoday.com, Chris Reed. Chris will be here to give us the first year verdict. That's right, the verdict on the Raiders' 2018 draft class. You can read his story on this on the website, but he'll break it down 
and we'll ask him some questions about that. The second hour starts with a surprise this week in a discussion around where the Raiders will play in 2019. We have a new player, Matt, right? And uh, in 2019, uh, Ollie Farhang, an attorney and arena football league owner in Tucson, Arizona, said this week that he's talked, he talked to the Raiders and Mark Bedane about hosting the Raiders at the University of Arizona Stadium, which is called Arizona Stadium. Uh, And so he'll give us his pitch and how feasible it might be for Tucson to be the home of the silver and black next year. I've always been on the uh, the side that you can't play in another NFL team stadium, which would take out Glendale. Tucson, a little further south, I, th- I think that's doable. I think playing in, in any, whether it's Fresno, Cal, Tucson, uh, Tempe may be a little too close to home for the Cardinals. But, you know, if you if you get into a, to a college team stadium, then I think that's fine. But playing in Levi or playing in Glendale or even playing in a, in a baseball stadium like uh, like AT&T Park. I think that just creates too many problems, and we're, we're sick of seeing the baseball field anyway. But playing <laughs> in another team stadium, I think, creates too many problems. Well, and it's, it's an interesting late um, addition to the consideration pool. We did a, a poll on it of all of you, and we'll give you the results of that later as well. Also in the second hour, our cousin Vinny, Vinny Bonsignori, is back. Uh, of the Athletic in Los Angeles. He's now on to talk about the team he covers on a regular basis, and that, of course, is the Rams. He'll give us the insight on last night's big win by the Rams and how they uh, bounced, not surprisingly, the Cowboys from the playoffs yesterday. And so Vinny will be here to talk about that and and, and, and if the Rams really have what it takes to get there. Then, of course, uh, the popular segment every week, Matt's Audible. And today uh, is a day that we also find out, Matt, where any college football player that wants to um, declare for the NFL draft must do so today. Yeah, it's it's such a man NCAA and their hypocrisy. It's such a big decision <laughs> to oh. to have to go through these steps not knowing exactly where you're going to be. I, I've always said, man, if 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 you don't get drafted, go back to school. Yeah, in that, what, don't in get what an world? Agent and, yeah, right. In what world can you not? go back to school while making money or not go back to school after you attempted to make money and it didn't work out yet, so you need to go get more schooling, right. in which case for football players, although there is an education there, schooling is football. Right. It's, it's, it's growing. It's getting better. It's, it's mastering your craft, right? Correct. Why, yeah, why, why, why are they denying them the opportunity to do that? No, you're not ready for this. We're sorry, guys. You're not ready to come play here. Go back and get better. Sure, no problem. MC- NCAA, no, you, you tried to leave us. We're <laughs> scorned. We're, yeah. you, you can't have you now. Well, and I understand the point of view. The only part of, of it that makes sense from the NCAA perspective is just that leaving college teams with unknowns because the draft is until April and there's recruiting periods and all that kind of stuff. But I agree with you, Matt. I think there should be, and it shouldn't, I, you, you, you should be able to acquire an agent, not accept any money. And the agent has to realize that, okay, I'm going to represent this kid and I might not get anything, so it's a risk for them. As long as they don't get drafted and then pull the trigger or what whatnot, then I think they should be able to go back to school, even if they have an agent. I, I just, I, so I agree with you 100%. The hypocrisy of the NCAA continues. It's a money game. It is. It is a de facto professional sport. I don't care what anybody says. I still don't believe in paying kids. It's a whole different story. But I do believe there needs to be more flexibility I think you if need a kid to let, wants to explore. I think you need to let the kids get paid, though. All right. If you're on a if you're on a full band scholarship, you allowed to get a job, and make money. Um, yes, but so what do you do? So then the the woman golfer gets paid as much. No, as no, no. I'm not talking about the university paying. But if oh, if a kid wants a to go job. out and get yes, sponsorship, absolutely. If if Nike steps up and goes, hey, Trevor Lawrence, we wanna we wanna represent you. Here's here's a million dollar check, and we're gonna throw your name on a couple items. Cool. Thanks. Oh, that's an we appreciate conversation. it. We'll have to have that one. That's a good one. I like that. Um, but uh, so we're going to do that. We'll also um, talk. Take your calls if you want to call in. Let us know. I'm already going through football withdrawal, Matt. I, you know, even though we have the playoffs, <laughs> we, even though we, ha- we we have the playoffs, we don't have the Raiders, which is the team we cover. Of course, it's the hometown team. Uh, they're going to be the Las Vegas Raiders, and of course, Just call them it now. Yes, exactly. I, 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 you know, unless they play in Oakland next year, if they play in Oakland next year, I will call them Oakland if Raiders. If they play anywhere but the Coliseum. It's Vegas Raiders. <laughs> I agree that's 100%. It. That's it. Now, the other thing is the, a big step in them becoming the Las Vegas Raiders. You and I are going to be out there tomorrow yeah. morning as the Raiders uh, do the groundbreaking for their 
headquarters and practice facility in Henderson, which is, a, a, for lack of a better term, a suburb. It's a separate city, actually. Uh, but but we consider it sort of a suburb of Las Vegas. It's all or in Las the valley. Vegas valley. If you're in the valley, you're in the valley. That's I mean, right. Henderson, North Las Vegas, Las Vegas. You have three Las technical Vegas. jurisdictions out here, but Correct. Yeah. it's all Add the county it's and it's one. four. But, yeah, yeah you're right. So, so we're going to be out there tomorrow covering that. Uh, we'll bring you audio next week either on the podcast or on the show to talk about that. But we'll, we'll see also if we get any insight there. The Raiders are really good about kind of keeping things under wraps. But we'll see if we get any insight into where they might be playing after that. Although the day will be focused, of course, Matt, on Henderson. But it's a huge move. Man, this thing and is you, get cool. to, you get to physically in person tell Mark Bedane, dude, you got to build parking cover. Yes, man. We, we <laughs> <laughs> I assume that we're going to be spending a little bit of time out there and training camp, although they're going to have the indoor fields, which is which is great that they're going to have those in there. But, but I think a field and a half is going to be indoor temperature controlled uh, for most of the year won't be an issue. But early on in camp, getting ready for the season, it's going to be 110 degrees out there. Yeah. Anybody. All, obviously, those of you living here, but anybody that's ever been to Vegas in the summer and has had to park their car in the sun understands <laughs> what kind of oven that thing turns into. It does. It's like a kiln, yes. not just an oven, but yes. a kiln. Okay, so now if you're watching on YouTube or any of the other channels, you'll see a picture in the bottom corner of a big thing that's available tomorrow, Matt, and that is if you're part of Raider Nation in Nevada, not just Las Vegas, the entire state, the Raiders license plate, which you can see there on the image, uh, and we'll post it up with the audio stuff later, but um, you'll see you can now get a Raiders license plate in the state of Nevada. So, Matt, that's a that's a big deal, too, uh, for Raider fans. We'll see. I don't think it'll come anywhere near close to what the Golden Knights license plate did because it's just that, that was, that's that was been so far on a pace, as we wrote in the story about the Raiders uh, license plate on silverblacktoday.com. Um, it, it's, it's on pace to become the most adopted pr- um, specialty plate in all of Nevada history. My registration is due in February. I'm go. I'm going. I'm, well, I've got the UNLV plate. You know. <laughs> I know you do. You know. But that was the only sports-related specialty plate that we had for years. That's the right. only one. My wife has a UNLV plate, and it's the old musket hay reb because that was the first one that they did. They did it as a throwback style. I had style. that one too. I've got. Out. I've got not the new, ugly one that no. they just ditched, but the, the one that one. we've all become accustomed to. I've got that plate on there. But we have options now. <laughs> we have options now. I, you well, know what I love about the the Knights plate? It says Vegas born on it. That's a cool touch. But the Raiders one says commitment to excellence on the bottom. There's some good stuff out there, there is. man. And, you know, here's the thing, too, is, you know, I've been hard on UNLV. We don't talk about UNLV here because we're not a general sports show. But on Adrenaline, with you guys on Saturday mornings from 8 to 10, I've been very hard on them because of the mess that UNLV has been. Mm-hmm. Hopefully they're going to start writing the ship there now. But um, what blew my mind, is that there's twice as many UNR plates registered in Nevada as there are UNLV plates, which is crazy because Las Vegas is a bigger area. More people have gone through UNLV in recent years. A lot of them stay in town. So that was just shocking to me uh, that, that that was doubled. Well, I think it speaks to where your programs are at. Because uh, let's be sure, honest, if you're, you're right? going to get a UNLV plate, 90% of the time it's not going to be just because you're an alum. It's going to be because you're supporting the sports programs more than anything else. You want to have that that representation. If UNLV is a top 25 basketball program and they're a seven or eight win bowl team every season in football, then you're probably going to be a little more apt to go after that UNLV plate. There's a reason that the Golden Knights plate is doing what it's doing, and it's because they're winning and people are on board. They want to be a part of it. You can't go anywhere. You can't go five feet in the city without seeing Golden Knights stuff. Oh, yeah. Everybody wants to be a part of a winning program. UNLV is not right. That. The buzz and and it's and that's what they have to do. That's why um, you know all the moves that you make from coaching to all the stuff is imbi- important, as as we know from the Raiders too. Now, Matt, we've had some questions on the video chats um, with YouTube and Facebook about the Henderson headquarters, mm-hmm. um, and we got about forty five seconds left before the first break. But in essence, the timeline is they're starting on it now. Um, and, and, and from everything I've been told from people in the organization is they will be in that building come the, the a very end of next season. And I think they'll probably start moving to some people in early because the foundation and all these other folks are already here in Las Vegas. But it will be up and running uh, towards the tail end of next year. So there you go. Yeah, when the season ends, you have to be ready to jump into Vegas with both feet no matter what. You need that thing done. That's right. All right, we're going to step aside. When we come back, 
We're going to be joined by Gilbert Manzano live from Gillette Stadium in Foxborough, Chargers and Patriots. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. The law office of Michael A. Troyan. Callers and guests on the Newsmaker Line are brought to you by the Law Office of Michael A. Troiano. Help us talk the silver and black. Call us at 702-889-5978. Here's Matt Gutierrez and your host, Scott Gulbranson, on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. All right, welcome back to the silver and black today on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. We're going to go out right away. We are so appreciative that he's given us his time right before the start of the game. He doesn't have a lot of time, but we're bringing in Gilbert Manzano. Gilbert was uh, covered the Raiders here at the Review Journal, but he's gone on to bigger and better things with 
the Orange County Register. He is now the Chargers beat writer down there. Gilbert, how you doing, man? Are you staying warm? I think it's like 19 <laughs> degrees there, right? Oh, no, it's worse. It's 17 degrees. I, I'm <laughs> trying to survive out here. It was a long walk into the press box, but I think I'm okay now. Oh, boy, man. For a California kid, you're uh, you're out of your element. But uh, uh, a, <laughs> a big game. So if we look at some of the superlatives here, um, Gilbert, first conference championship game between the number five and six seed since the 12-team format began in 90. And, of course, one of the stories, Brady 41, Rivers 37, the oldest combined age by opposing starting quarterbacks in postseason game history in the NFL. Now, if you look at this game, okay, we can talk all day about the quarterbacks, but to me, Gilbert, the key is going to be the Chargers defense putting pressure, of course, on Tom Brady. How do you, how well do you think they're equipped to do that and to maybe come out of Foxborough with a win? Yeah, a year ago, these two teams played uh, the Patriots and the Chargers, and Joey Bosa and uh, Melvin Ingram had a big day, uh, uh, you know, putting pressure on the Patriots O line. So I think that could be a problem again for them, especially after what Melvin Ingram did a week ago in that wild card game against the Ravens. Uh, they, they couldn't stop them, and I feel like the Ravens have a better O line than the, the Patriots. The Patriots have a lot of new guys. There's no Nate Shoulder out there, a left tackle. There's a bu- you know, a bunch of guys are kind of. Just kind of seeing how it goes, and, and so far it's worked this year. But now you got Melvin Ingram and Joey Bosa, and they got a lot of talent behind them. It's not just those two guys. You know, we mentioned uh, you know some of those DBs are they're pretty doing well. Uh, Desmond King, Casey uh, Hayward. So it's not just Joey Bosa and Ingram. It's a lot of guys that to be worried about. So I know Tom Brady is very aware of that. Hey Gilbert, man, good to have you back on the show. It's been a while. How's how's SoCal treating you? Hey, not bad. Uh, I'm liking it so far, but I still miss Vegas a lot. That's still my <laughs> second home. Man. I feel like it's, it's always going to be our home away from home today. So let me, let me ask you. So last time Phillip Rivers was was in New England for a playoff game, he was playing on a torn ACL. He had a torn meniscus, and Ladanian Tomlinson was sitting on the bench with his jacket on, with an apparent injury that everybody was giving him a bunch of bunch of heat for. Now you've got Phillip Rivers coming in with with finally a, a healthy uh, uh, Ingram back there or excuse me gordon back there running the ball what do you think that that run game for rivers to finally have an established run game going in against a patriots team that doesn't really have the same kind of offense that they've had in the past he has an established run game he's got a good defense now he doesn't have to do everything which we've seen in the playoffs he hasn't been able to do everything yeah, I think uh, Philip brought up in, uh, in the, I guess some of his news conferences this week that this is a different team from way back in 2007 when he played with a torn ACL and LT had an injury and Antonio Gates had a toe injury. They're they're a lot more healthier this time around. I know Melvin Gordon has a few injuries. He, he won't be. I don't think he's going to be 100%, but he's still going to be out there, and that's big to have him there. But it's just not Melvin Gordon. They have, they have Keenan Allen. Uh, they got Tyrell Williams, Mike Williams. It's not just Vincent Jackson from 2007. He has a lot of weapons to throw, too. He still has Antonio Gates there doing well. He might get Hunter Henry. We'll find out in a few minutes there when the injury report comes out. But overall, this might be Rivers' best team since the last time he was in there against uh, uh, Tom Brady. So we'll see how it looks. But I think this, this is probably the team that could probably get him over the hump because, he's, you know, as people know, he's winless against Brady. He's uh, 0-7. Yeah, again, we're talking to Gilbert Manzano, the Chargers beat writer for the Orange County Register and former Las Vegas Review Journal uh, sports reporter as well. Now, you talked about that receiving core, uh, Gilbert, and, of course, Keenan Allen, the, the season veteran, 1,200 yards pretty much. Uh, he's had 200 catches since 2017. It's the most in a two-year span in franchise history. Mike Williams led the team 10 touchdowns. Um, what are they – I mean, that 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 – New England defense, I think, is is a little bit uh, – is not what it used to be, I'll put it that way, as you mentioned earlier on. Um, you expect a big day from those guys despite the cold weather? Yeah, it's, it's not the same, uh, you know, big stars that they're in New England defense. But, you know, when you give Bill Belichick an extra week to prepare – he always makes it work with what he has. So that could be an issue. Uh, I'm sure they, they study tapes because, you know, the last five weeks, the Chargers offense has kind of been off. I know they don't have to really do too much because that defense is doing well. Uh, the field goal, uh, they've been making field goals with their kicker, uh, Michael Badley, so they've kind of been bailed out. But if uh, Bill Belichick has a good game plan for Philip Burris, and you're going to have to score touchdowns, that could be a problem. But, but, but you're right there. You know, they don't have the same star that they once had. But you give Belichick time, and you'll make it work. Talk about Tom Brady's uh, perceived decline this season. I mean, he's he's 41 now. He he hasn't he hasn't had the season this year that that you've seen him put up in the past. That consistency, that that same arm strength, uh, doesn't look like the same guy. And I mean, that's that's to be expected when you get to this point in your career. Has there been a lot of talk about just just getting to him, rattling him because he's not the same guy anymore, and and being able to slow down this 
not explosive offense that that New England is dealing with now. Yeah, it's crazy to think that uh, people are saying that uh, Tom Brady's on a big time at 41 years old, but he's still there for 4,000 yards. He's almost got the 30 <laughs> touchdowns. So for him, it, it's uh, just another season. But for his standards, it's not the typical Tom Brady. But, yeah, you kind of see a little bit with Father Time gives him, you know, a little bit. We don't know how much. Maybe we'll find out today. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure Tom Brady used that as motivation that he's on, you know, on a big time. But you, you, you got to think, eventually it's going to get there. So who knows? And a lot of people are thinking that these, this charges seem to be the one that kind of, you know, start, you know, putting – kind of maybe, you know, put it an end to this dynasty and it could start today. So we'll see. But I'm sure, you know, Tom Brady hears that. He hears uh, Robert Gronkowski might retire. He hears Belichick. There's like drama with him and Belichick. And he probably hears all of these negative stories. And I'm sure Tom Brady is using it as fuel. Well, uh, Gilbert, on the other side of the ball, Philip Rivers, 37 years old. He's also going I- into the, the final stages of his career for how long we're not sure. But the, the, the Philip Rivers has put up so many numbers and, and has, has really – done an amazing job of doing that and of, of, of being a quarterback in the NFL, yet he's not been able to get there and win that big game. Um, do, does Phillip Rivers, you think, this year, I mean, is he is he a surefire Hall of Fame guy, or do you think this type of year where he could go to New England, beat the Patriots, and then go on to the AFC Championship game no matter what happens there, and that might solidify his position? Yeah, I, I think he's a Hall of Famer. I think he's a far, first battle Hall of Famer, but I don't have a vote, and I'm sure for Phillip Rivers, he would like to, you know, you know, add some more to the resume, and 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 not even just Hall of Fame status. Philip Rivers is a competitor. I'm sure he gets up every day early, doing that commute from San Diego to Costa Mesa every day because he wants a Super Bowl title, and he he knows that how these opportunities are kind of rare for him. He got to the playoffs maybe four years straight when he took over as a starter, and then in the last decade he's only had two appearances in the playoffs, including this one. So he knows these things are not, you know, guaranteed every year. And and he probably he's probably thinking, man, I had, I had to face Tom Brady a decade ago. He's here we go again. You got to get to the Patriots to kind of get over the hump. So for him, being a competitor, I think he wanted that match. I think he wanted to get to Tom Brady and the Patriots. So I think if he, I think if he gets this game, you know, it, it, it will help for his legacy. But for him, a competitor, for him personally, I'm sure he really wants this and hopefully, you know, get to the Super Bowl. All right, Gilbert. Right, just a few seconds before we let you go. Uh, what do you think happens in this game? The Chargers are going to get up, be in, go in there and be able to upset the Patriots? I think so, too. I'm just not really sure how. So this team is very strange. They kind of get off slow starts lately, and they love to come back. But if they get off to a slow start and, and try to come back against Tom Brady, that's kind of that's not, not a good idea, thing to do. It's imp- nearly impossible to do. Gillette Stadium, they haven't lost a playoff game here in 2012. But I think they got it done. We, we talked about the pass rushers. They got the defense. They got the special teams. They, don't have, they used to not have a kicker. They got Michael Basley. They got a punt returner in Desmond King. They got Rivers. He's healthy. And I think this is the year to do it. So, uh, you know. I feel like they're going to get it done uh, in a few hours from now. All right. Gilbert Manzano, thanks for taking the time, buddy. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you real soon. Thank you, guys. Always a pleasure. Appreciate the time. All right. Gilbert Manzano from the Orange County Register, the Chargers beat writer uh, down there with some insight into the game live from Foxborough, Massachusetts. What do you think, man? What do you think is going to happen in this game, Matt? Uh, I... I'm leaning towards the Chargers. Uh, it's 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 always hard to go against the Patriots at home. We've seen that. I mean, they've been great at home. Unless you're Baltimore, I think Baltimore is one of the only teams that's been able to go in there and beat them. Um, but they, they're just they're a difficult matchup at home. But again, this isn't the same Patriots team. I I know their their record was was good this year. They won the East again, but they just don't have that same kind of swagger. They don't have that air of invincibility that they've had in the past, and and that. That speaks to not only just Tom Brady getting older and not being the same guy anymore, but Gronkowski's he's always beat up. And that guy is forever oh, injured, yeah. hence hence the, They've had the a reti- lot of injuries, retirement right. talks. They they're leaning a little more on the run game, which isn't a bad thing. Sony Michelle's been been pretty good lately. Um but it's it's just not the same they don't have that scare factor anymore, I don't think. I it, it's not that same kind of team. Yeah, they were in the Super Bowl last year. I get that. Things change pretty quickly in the NFL, yeah. and they haven't changed for the Patriots in 16 years. To this their, may be to, the time but it changes. I, I will say to their to their advantage, and this is huge advantage. I know we're going to talk about playoff advantages in your in your audible segment later, but when you have that experience and you're eight zero at home, that's a big thing to overcome. But just to, you mentioned Gronkowski. I want to say this: 12 career playoff TD catches. He's tied with Hall of Famer John Stallworth for the second most in postseason history. So who's it, first? Good question. Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice. That's right. The GOAT, without a question. He's in the 20s, I think. Yeah, <laughs> he's amazing. <laughs> All right. Uh, when we come back, we're going to go down to San Diego. 
bring in the sage of sports talk in America's finest city, and that, of course, is Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. He's going to tell us the latest on the Raiders perhaps playing in San Diego in 2019. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. The Army National Guard is committed. Callers and guests on the Newsmaker Line are brought to you by the Law Office of Michael A. Troiano. Hey, this is Rodney Hudson. You're listening to Silver and Black today. All right. Rodney Hudson brings us back in here. Silver and Black today coming to you live from the Dollar Loan Center, don't be broke.com studios at CBS Sports Radio 1140 AM in Las Vegas. A chilly Las Vegas, but you know what? We're, we're wimps here because uh, it is, it's warm all the time. But anyway, we are now going to go back out on the attorney Michael Troiano newsmaker line to bring in one of our favorite guests. And, of course, that is the sports talk sage 
of San Diego, and that is Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Lee, how you doing this morning? Happy Sunday. Good morning. You ready for a little NFL playoff football on Sunday after what we saw the dominance on Saturday? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's going to be, uh, and of course, being in San Diego where there's still some Charger fans, even though they're upset, um, uh, going to Foxborough. We just talked to Gilbert Manzano from the Orange County Register. Uh, he likes their chances there today, and I know we're going to talk to you about that in a second, Lee. But first, let's get to some Raider-related news as it relates to San Diego, and that was, of course, a local radio host down there in San Diego claims that an attorney that works in the mayor's office, uh, Kevin Falconer down in San Diego, told him that the Raiders in San Diego have been talking. The mayor's office has denied this. What are you hearing about official conversations between the Raiders and the uh, city of San Diego about playing there in 2019? I heard there were no conversations. Uh, It had been intimated that uh, uh, Mike Bardane, the team president, the Joseph Yao, the head legal counsel of the Raiders, had been in contact with the mayor's office. Craig Gustafson, the spokesman for the mayor, says there has never been a conversation with either of them. Uh, I don't quite understand why the city of San Diego has not reached out to the Raiders, but it may well be that the NFL has kind of intimated through its, its pipeline to the mayor's office that we don't want them in Southern California. We need them to stay in Northern California and service the bulk of their fans. So I don't think that conversation took place, at least according to what the mayor's office has said. There's been no conversation with the legal counsel and the president, and those are the guys that would be negotiating the deal. They're the ones that obviously approached the Giants about going to AT&T Park. They approached Stanford about going to Palo Alto. Uh, they, They had tried to have conversations with Cal Berkeley about playing at Memorial Stadium. So it's unresolved. I was told that the NFL has informed the Raiders, you must tell us <coughs> by Super Bowl week as to where you're going to relocate. So it's really up in the air. Uh, I know across the state line, Nevada, Reno has made their facility available. I don't know that that makes a lot of business sense for anybody. And, of course, there's the, the wild-eyed story about them going to London <laughs> and, playing, and playing four straight home games in London as the NFL's representative in that city, and the other four games somewhere in Northern California, maybe at the Giants baseball stadium. But that, that to me, would, it would really be a stretch, and I think it would be terribly unfair to John Gruden and all the players to kind of make them a, a permanent uh, road team. I mean, you, you think about they would have to move their entire practice facility to London uh, for a, a span of about five to six weeks. And I, I just I think that'd be an impossible way to do your business. Uh, so I, I think they'll find some way to stay in Northern California, and I do not think the league wants them in San Diego. Lee, let's, let's assume the NFL doesn't get involved. Is there a sense that the brass in San Diego is, is willing to listen to the Raiders, talk to the Raiders, and even bring them in, or is it just – you know, yeah, we'll, we'll hear what they have to say, but this, this isn't anything that we want. I don't understand the inertia from the San Diego leadership standpoint. Uh, now, they, they're not going to give the stadium to Mark Davis to come play here free for a year. That's not going to happen. But if Mark Davis is willing to pay $7.5 million to stay at the Oakland Coliseum, then take that $7.5 million and, and, and bring it here. Mm-hmm. It costs the city of San Diego $11 million a year to keep that empty stadium open. Uh, that empty stadium is, is only the home of, of San Diego State Aztec football and an odd, an odd usage sometimes for soccer, but virtually nothing. All the other non-football events that used to be at, at, at Jack Murphy, Qualcomm, SDCCU <laughs> Stadium, all, all those non-football events have now gone all downtown to Petco Park. Petco yeah. Park has become quite a moneymaker uh, for the baseball ownership uh, out, outside of the baseball season when the Potteries play there. So I, I, my own personal opinion is why not the Raiders, but it's got to come at a, a price tag. I mean, the, the, the city here is strapped for finances. If they could get $7 million from Mark Davis to rent that facility, why would you not do that? Right. The, only other, the only other tenant they're going to have there in 2019 will be in February, March, and April when the Alliance for American Football puts the San Diego fleet here. But that's only five games. Uh, so I, that, that's where we stand as of a Sunday morning in January. 
things can change, uh, but I, you know, I've been told from people in and around the mayor's office that there was no conversation with Yao, no conversation with Bardane. Again, we're speaking to Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Uh, you can visit him at LeeHacksawHamilton.com, of course, longtime voice of the NFL and uh, uh, really someone who started the whole sports talk revolution as well. Now, Lee, let's move to the playoffs. Yesterday, comments on Rams and the Chiefs and both domination in their games. Well, so much had been written and said, and we watched Dallas totally dominate uh, towards the second half of the season. They won eight of ten games. Uh, obviously, the Amari Cooper uh, acquisition from the Raiders was a tremendous player pickup because it changed the persona of the entire Dallas offense. Lost in, in all those things was how really well Dallas's defensive front seven was playing during that hot streak, that eight and two run. Boy, they got trampled yesterday. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Rams just came out, and the Rams went through a personality change a couple of weeks ago out of necessity because they got so many guys banged up. They became more of a run team, and they went out, and they signed C.J. Anderson, the ex-Denver Bronco. Uh, they signed him because Todd Gurley was dinged up with knee inflammation. They signed him because he was probably the best veteran running back that was on the street corner who was in shape. He had been in and out of a, a wide variety of camps. He had had not been re-signed by the Broncos, and he went to Carolina and went through their camp and started the season there, and then he got released maybe a month in, and then he bounced around, and he was visiting teams and working out for teams, and, uh, you know, the Raiders brought him in for a cup of coffee for one week and then cut him loose, but he was in game shape, and he showed up, and, boy, did he fill a need. He's had three straight 100-yard games since he joined the Rams, and he has really helped them at great length and now obviously Gurley came back healthy last night and then sure looked like the Todd Gurley we've seen over this course of a potential MVP season so now you got those two guys pounding D- Dallas's defensive front seven I was stunned how def- that Dallas defense got pushed all over the field yeah that offensive line of the Rams Lee I mean they they just and both sides of the ball actually offense and defense the Rams just controlled that line of scrimmage yeah, they really did. And Andrew Whitworth and those guys in that offensive front, I mean, th- that's a very good group. But, boy, they just shoved it down Dallas' throat. And then Dak Prescott had to play catch-up. And the Rams uh, Rams played much more inspired defense than they've played in a long time. So, I mean, you run for 273. That, that's what the Rams <laughs> finished up with. That's a phenomenal accomplishment against a Dallas front seven that was playing really well. And then what happens is, because they control the football, that defense is on the field forever. That defense dies on the field, and it's impossible for Prescott. And Zeke Elliott was held to 47 because it came a, throw, a throwing game. Uh, that, that that's a pretty dominant win by LA. And now they're you know they're going to get the chance maybe to go play in New Orleans, and they'll they'll try to duplicate that doggone thing again. I I if I am the Rams going to play the Saints, if the Saints win this game uh, tonight. Uh, you know, if I run the football, I may, yeah. I, oh, may, yeah. I make New Orleans front prove that they can stop Todd Gurley and C.J. Anderson. And by doing that, time of possession, dominant, wear them out, you wind up keeping Drew Brees on the, on the sideline. So that'll be fascinating next week if the Saints win, and I do expect the Saints to win. But that was, that was some stand-them-up, knock-them-down performance by that Rams offensive front on those two running backs yesterday. And Lee, let's jump over to the Chargers now. Uh, Big game for them going to New England, you know, the, the perennial juggernaut in the NFL. How's how's the buzz in San Diego for this team having, you know, still still licking their wounds from losing the team? And, and how do you see this game going? Does Phillip Rivers, can, can he finally turn this around, go into New England, get that big win and beat Brady? I think they can. I think they, they definitely have the firepower to do it. I think they have more skilled people than New Orleans. This might be the last stand. I'm sorry, of New England. This might be the last stand of, of Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, and the Patriots. They are a shell of the greatness that they have been for a decade and a half. Rivers has an awful lot of bullets in the gun. Now, they're, they're going in, and they're going to play in pretty cold weather. Now, they're, they're talking 26 to 28 degrees at kickoff with some wind dropping into the teens. As long as it's not windy, you can play in that, and then it becomes just football weather. Uh, but I, I just think they have Rivers has so much firepower. Mm-hmm. They are playing right now with such enormous confidence. And and from the New England standpoint, you know Brady Brady has Sonny Michelle as his running back. He's got James White catching the ball out of the backfield. He's got Gronkowski. 
And he's got contributors at wide receiver, though I don't think that Julian Edelman and, and Hogan and those guys really scare opposing cornerbacks. Uh, the matchups will be fun. Uh, the, the, the reason the Chargers have won these critical games, and they've won four now on the road, that nobody probably ever thought they would win. The reason they've won in Seattle and in Pittsburgh and in Kansas City, and then when they punched Baltimore in the mouth last weekend, is because that defensive coordinator, Gus Bradley, has been able to come up with game plans that have taken away the strengths of the other quarterbacks. I mean, they did it oh, to yeah. Russell. They, they did it to Russell Wilson. They made him hold the football to the fact, point he got sacked. They made Ben Roethlisberger a check-down quarterback, you, you know, challenging him that, all right, you complete all these eight-yard passes. We're not letting Antonio Brown and, and Juju Smith-Schuster run wild on us. Uh, they no, got that... involved in the shootout, and they won a narrowhead. And then last week, they went with nickel-dime and seven-back packages because of the, the youth of Lamar Jackson and the fact that they were making Lamar Jackson read defenses that he was not prepared to read at the line of scrimmage, and their offense totally went away, and they, they blitzed the hell out of the gaps. I so like, Gus, Brad, hey, Lee, Gus I like, Bradley's done a hell of a job. He has, and I like their chances. Again, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton, LeeHacksawHamilton.com. Lee, we'll have you on to talk about uh, the Super Bowl before the game comes up. Yeah, if you get a chance, check my website this morning because I wrote a huge statistical column about all the dominance of the Patriots and where the Chargers are right now statistically. It's kind of fascinating when you look at the numbers and say, wow, I didn't know that, but that's that's on the website this morning. Gentlemen, good to talk to you. Thank you, as always, Lee. We appreciate it. Lee Hacksaw Hamilton here on silverandblacktoday.com. We'll be right back right after this.
Radio 1140. The only way to take silver and black today with you is with the Radio.com app. Download it today and search CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas and listen to us anytime, anywhere. Welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 AM. We now, again, are going to go out on the uh, attorney Michael Troiano newsmaker line and bring in with us someone that anyone who reads the silverandblacktoday.com website will be familiar with, and that, of course, is our senior NFL analyst, the guy who breaks down the film and the play. Uh, he's our coach, our on-staff coach, football coach, and that, of course, is Chris Reed. How are you doing today, Chris? Hey, pretty good. I wish I was going to that groundbreaking ceremony with you guys. Nice <laughs> to get all that stuff built. We, we wish you were there. We even have uh, one of our, our loyal, longtime listeners from back when we just started the podcast, Ariel, is doing a tailgate across the street, man. So uh, if, if people want to know if, if Las Vegas is behind the Raiders coming to, uh, to our city, all you got to do is look at Ariel. He's having a tailgate for uh, the groundbreaking of the headquarters. So that t- shows you how crazy uh, uh, Las Vegas is for the Raiders. All right, Chris, well, listen, this week, this past week, you wrote a piece up on the website uh, where you pass a little judgment. You said, hey, let's look at the Raiders 2018 draft class. Of course, a lot of controversy for some of the guys taken in the first three rounds, including Colton Miller, 15 overall, including P.J. Hall, including Brandon Parker. Uh, you went through and kind of broke down some film. Let's start with Colton Miller. Give us your kind of take on him. 15th overall, first-round pick, 2018. What's the verdict on Colton Miller so far? Uh, well, you got to kind of admire his toughness, the way he, he played through injuries and stuff. As far as what he needs to improve on, he's got a little stiffness in his like ankle-knee bend, and that six foot nine frame let a lot of guys get inside on him, so he really needs to work his hand fighting, and you know any rookie's going to need to get stronger. So hopefully they're, they're working his hands this, this offseason. Chris, man, good to talk to you. It's been a while. Um, let yeah. me, I want to jump to, to my guy, the guy, the guy that I was on for you. Knew, you already knew where I was going. Doug Martin? Scott. Doug no, Martin? That's your guy. That's your guy right there. Uh, Arden key, man. He, uh, round three, number 87 overall for the Raiders. This was the guy that they, they felt could come in and be, and be a, a solid pass rusher, get, you know, bend the edge and, and really get after the quarterback. And we saw flashes from him this year. You saw the quickness. But just just too slight, not enough not enough mass on his frame yet, not enough strength, and not able to finish plays and bring guys to the ground. How did you see Arden Key play out this year? Oh, you hit it pretty good. He he needs to bulk up some, and then uh, man, he would have had so many sacks this season if he could have just come under control and, and played a little lower. He got too high a lot of times when he'd finally get to the quarterback, and they were able to, you know, get away from him. Yeah, I, I, that assessment is spot on. You hear that term a lot when it comes to, to linemen, both offensive and de- defensive. It's that base, right? It's that, it, it's having that solid foundation, being able to, to find that, that lower center of gravity and, and get oh, yeah. these guys down. And, yeah, playing high, that's, I think that's, that's exactly the way to describe our yeah. key right now. Uh, okay, so, Chris, let's move on to P.J. Hall. We're not going to talk about Maurice Hurst today because I think uh, we'll, we'll talk about him another time. But I think overall – Raider Nation feels like, hey, this guy was the real deal. We got to steal with him. Now, with PJ Hall, talk about his progression. I thought he did really well, especially as the season went on. What is it about PJ Hall that that made him a success? And it might start turning heads to think, well, geez, maybe that wasn't such a, 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 a misguided draft pick, if you will. Uh, I love his burst, his, his get off. They were able to play him at the one, the three, the five, and you know he was able to get into the backfield. And the way teams are going so much to outside zone runs you're seeing jet sweeps the thing that really hurts that is interior pressure when you can just shoot a gap and get into the backfield and pj hall is is perfect for that do you think do you think i like pj hall and i i realized this in in the preseason not not just his physical ability and and you know that that stout kind of frame he has coming off the ball right at you, but he he seemed to have a very high football IQ, and I saw it I saw it right off the bat uh, preseason and and then early in the in the football season itself, where he just he gets the position. If he's not going to get there, you see him drop right away and get his hands up in the passing lanes. Uh, he batted down a handful of passes early on. He just seems to have that that 
He does. He, and that get it, right? He, yeah. he understands the kid. game. Yeah. Yeah, and I love that. Now, Chris, in the minute we have left, um, let's talk about Brandon Parker. He's a kid I really like. I thought that because of injuries, he was probably thrown in there a little too early. So he had some really big ups and some really big downs throughout the course of the year. Where does Brandon Parker sit after we play after he played one season in the NFL? Uh he he definitely got in there a little too quick. Yeah, he would have been like third on the depth chart. You figure going into it with Gio Camini and then probably ten in front of him as well. So it, it did hurt him, you know, the the offense last season. But hopefully that that experience will, will you know carry over into next year and maybe he can kind of progress a little bit quicker now that he's seen it. But it's kind of the same thing with Colton Miller. He's six eight and, and has an issue with his hands. You know, letting guys get inside. Um, so they'll, they'll kind of be, I'm sure, tag team buddies this, this um, <laughs> off season. You have to figure with Brandon Parker that they're, they're going to, quote, unquote, uh, recruit over him, right, for, yeah. at least for this coming season. I don't, I don't think they're going into the season saying, yeah, he's, he's absolutely going to be start. the starting right yeah. tackle. I'm going to assume whether it's in free agency or in the draft somewhere, they, they look to, to find somebody to solidify that right spot, at least for the near future. I agree. Depth is always good. All right, Chris Reed, senior NFL analyst with SilverAndBlackToday.com. Go read his stuff, especially his break, his popular breakdown stories, uh, SilverAndBlackToday.com. Chris, we'll talk to you real soon, buddy. Have a good weekend. Yeah, have fun out there, guys. All thanks, right, Chris. thanks, brother. All right, man, we're just as usual, Matt. We're we're driving through segments here in the books. When we come back, another interesting segment. We're going to be joined by Ali Farhang, attorney with Farhang and Medkoff. He is the man who says. Bring the Raiders to Tucson, Arizona to play at the University of Arizona Stadium, Arizona Stadium, uh, in 19. When we come back, we're going to talk to Ali and find out what he's got to say and about his conversations with the Raiders because he has officially talked to them. So we'll get that. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on Silver on CBS. Renaming the studio (laughs) in here. 11.40 a.m.
Get a shot of adrenaline, sports adrenaline, Saturday morning from 8 to 10 on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 a.m. The most in-depth coverage of the silver and black as they set their sights on Las Vegas for 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's silver and black today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. Now, here's Scott Gulbranson and Matt Gutierrez. Welcome back. Another football Sunday. There's only a few left. That's right. This weekend, of course, you have championship weekend and then the Super Bowl. I don't even count the Pro Bowl. Uh, but the Raiders <laughs> season is over, but that does not mean Raiders news isn't first and uh, foremost to us here on Las Vegas' only all Raiders talk show. Could the Raiders play 2019 in Tucson, Arizona? That is the question we're going to address now. And we welcome in Ali Farhang. He's an attorney at Farhang Medkoff. But more importantly, he's the guy who brought the, uh, the Arizona Bowl to Tucson. People in Nevada are familiar with that because the UNR Wolfpack played in it this year and won it. Uh, that was Tucson's first college bowl game. And also, he was on the Fiesta Bowl committee in the past. He is the owner of perhaps one of the best logos in all of sports. I swear, you got to check it out. The Arena Football League's Tucson Sugar Skulls. Ollie, thanks for joining us here on the Silver and Black today. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. And the answer to your question is yes, absolutely the Raiders should be playing in Tucson next year. <laughs> of course. That, that's, uh, <laughs> that's why we're having you on because when it, when it popped up, it's one of the locations, and, and you know, obviously, because you've had these discussions uh, with the Raiders, which we'll get to here in a second, but uh, you've heard all the cities bantered around from London to San Diego to, of course, Las Vegas, their future home, which isn't going to happen, Reno, um, all these other cities, San Antonio. Uh, but I, was, I saw yours pop up, and more importantly, you know, there's a lot of folks out there who will try to get in the news, uh, but no one with your, your resume, someone who has a professional sports team themselves, someone who's been instrumental in elevating their community with a bowl game and being on the Fiesta Bowl committee, uh, running national championships, all that kind of stuff. That's what caught my eyes. So tell us where it's at. You have you talked with Mark Bedane, somebody we know well. How was that conversation? Uh, how was it, I should say? And where did it go and where is it going next? You know, Mark, <clears throat> I, had a very, I had a very delightful conversation with Mark, and he was very uh, candid, open, honest, direct. And, you know, right now, I know the Raiders have been looking at a lot of options, and uh, we kind of threw our hat in the ring late. And where it stands now is uh, we have the president of the university, people from uh, state and local officials, uh, prominent business leaders in our community. We're all ready to come out there to uh, Oakland or meet in Las Vegas, wherever they like. And I think we can make a compelling case that not only is Tucson, Arizona, a good choice for the Raiders, it's the most visionary, out-of-the-box Raiders choice for the Raiders. Uh, Ali, Matt Gutierrez here, and thank you for joining us. I'm, I'm looking, real quick, I'm looking at the logo here for the Sugar Skulls, and I feel, <laughs> if, if anything has ever screamed Raider Nation as far as the logo goes, I feel like you went to the black hole, plucked somebody out of there, and just slapped a different color on them. I mean, it is, it is, it is an awesome logo. I love it. How, how much of a presence does Raider Nation have out there in Tucson? I mean, we know... It's called Raider Nation for a reason. They're everywhere. But what's the presence of fans like down there in, in Tucson being so close to, to Cardinals' home base? You know, Tucson, Southern Arizona, all of Arizona, uh, I would put a significant amount of money if you could drive around one day and not see a Raider sticker on somebody's car. Yeah. So with the Raiders moving to Las Vegas um, and the Southwest, you know, Tucson is really the epicenter between Las Vegas, Phoenix, uh, New Mexico, Southern California, and Mexico. So mm -hmm. while their presence is significant, I think that being in Tucson would even build their brand and um, significantly increase Raider Nation to, you know, to, to, to limits that it's never been seen before. So I think it'd be a great move for the Raiders. And obviously it would bring a lot to our community. Um, it would just be our town right now, just with the possibility, just with a, Short conversation with Mr. Bedane and uh, people reaching out to the Raiders. Our entire community is electric. I can't, wow. I mean, I can't walk out the house without people saying, bring the Raiders just as for <laughs> a few games. Um, I had somebody from Phoenix actually uh, order 100 tickets. So I already got started on tickets. I'm serious. I mean, they, they said, hey, I'd like 100, a block of 100 tickets. 
And, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's palpable how much energy and excitement is around Southern Arizona with the possibilities. That's awesome. We're talking to Ali Farhang from uh, Tucson, Arizona. He is trying to get the Raiders to come to Tucson for the 2019 season. And, and Ali, I mean, that, you're, you're a visionary leader, and that's what visionary leaders do. They don't look at what can't be done. They look at and say, why not? Now, if we look at Tucson, Arizona Stadium, 55,000 capacity. It does have field turf, which, as you know, Mark Bedane is not a, or excuse me, Mark Davis is not a fan of. Um, what about this stadium and the city of Tucson make it appealing to the Raiders if you're making that pitch? Well, <clears throat> other than the location, uh, University of Arizona Stadium is uh, basically in the last stages of some very significant uh, improvements. They're going to have an indoor facility uh for the summer and uh they're doing some things to the stadium itself um <clears throat> you know the, the field turf is is really nice it's this good uh, i actually also coach high school football uh, my mm. team uh just made its second uh appearance in the state championship game awesome i don't i'm not it's still too soon for me to talk about it so <laughs> move on from that topic uh, understood <laughs> yeah but um you know I think, you know, from my experience as the founder of the Nova Home Loans Arizona Bowl, the one thing that people come away with is uh, we're a very hospitable town. I mean, you, the Raiders will be welcomed with open arms and be treated like sons of Tucson and Southern Arizona. Um, and, and number two, um, you know, we're, we're a place where when there's a lot of energy and excitement, people come out in droves. So, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the open arms that they're going to be welcome with, the hospitality, um, the community support, um, building the brand and Raider Nation itself, uh, it's just, I don't know. That at first I was like, well, I'll call and I'll see how, how it goes. And then as we've been going along and putting the puzzle together a little bit, uh, I mean, it makes more and more sense. I mean, I think it's actually genius for the Raiders and it's, uh, mm. it's genius for Tucson. Ollie, when did when did that call take place? When did you first get this idea that you know what that this this is a viable option? This could work here. Was this you know the second they started talking about man, twenty nineteen is going to be an issue. Were they going to play, or was it just seeing the other options out there and going, man, we're set up for this. We're, we can do us? better than anybody else, right? You know, I think uh, when you, when you think about something like this, it's, it's important to be considerate and strategic. So. Uh, I kind of sat back and said, all right, I need to get, obviously, the, the blessing of the university. So I talked to the athletic director and the president, who are visionaries in their own right here in, here in Tucson. Um, and then I spoke with the governor's office, who, uh, who reached out to Cardinals, because, you know, the Cardinals are in Arizona, oh, yeah. and it's, it's, it's important to have that conversation to make sure they're okay with it. Once all of those things lined up, it was just a matter – I mean – to be really candid with you, I looked online to the Raiders and I got their general number and I uh, looked up <laughs> their executive staff and I just I asked for the president. So, <laughs> um, and uh, and you know what? Uh, I left about two or three messages and to his credit, whether they looked me up or did due diligence, uh, you know, Mark called me called me back and we had a conversation and it was a great conversation. Uh, it was about uh, I'd say about a week to ten days ago. We had that conversation, and since that time, I've had uh, you know former All American Ricky Hundley. Um, mm. You know, I know that uh, my partner with the Sugar Skulls is a guy named Kevin Guy. He's a Hall of Fame coach with the Arizona Rattlers right oh, yeah. now. So Kevin, you know, Kevin's been calling. So at this point, uh, whether it's with you know Mark Bedane or with Mark Davis, it's just a matter of uh, if we can get in a room with the president of the university and some 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 people, some prominent business leaders. Uh, I think we could, like I said, it's uh, all we can do is give it our best shot. I think we can make a really compelling case that uh, uh, not just uh, out of my mouth, but on paper <laughs> with numbers, we're willing to make, uh, we're, we're really going to welcome the Raiders with open arms. Again, we're talking to Ali Farhang uh, from Tucson, Arizona. And Ali, you, you talked about the Nova Home Loans Arizona Bowl. Of course, Nova Home Loans is a uh, proud sponsor here on CBS Sports Radio in Las Vegas. So we share that. Uh, but you, you know, having being the visionary to bring that, so you know the market, you know the market well. The communities uh, came out and really supported that game uh, amazingly. Uh, is that is that? I think that to me is first and foremost the pitch, right? Because it's not like San Antonio, where San Antonio's got Cowboy fans, they have Texans fans. Now you have Cardinal fans, I'm sure, 
in Tucson, but being a little bit removed from that Phoenix area, uh, was it difficult with the Cardinals to kind of get their um, tacit approval to even have the conversation? No, I mean, when you're born in Tucson, uh, the baby, the doctor slaps you on the ass and he says, uh, you hate Phoenix. So <laughs> to, to, to say, I mean, I, I, from, from that perspective, it's not, there's not going to be uh, any kind of split of loyalties. Um, but, you know, from my, what I understand, I didn't have the conversation myself, but um, somebody through the governor's office, they, they said, you know, they, they think that the Raiders are thinking about some other options, but, you know, it, go ahead and try. So once, once we got that blessing, um, you know, we went full, full force. That's well, awesome. Ollie, I tell you what, man, we uh, we had a pretty cool uh, logo out here for our arena football team a few years ago with the Las Vegas Outlaws, and unfortunately it didn't stick, and we didn't really see any merchandise around. I'm going to be looking for this Sugar Skulls merchandise out there because I'm telling you, I dig the logo. I think Raider Nation's going to dig the logo. And if uh, if you guys are fortunate enough to get the team out there, man, I think it's going to be really good for the 2019 season. And I agree, man. Uh, we're going to have our our own version of the black hole. Come on out here for a Tucson Sugar Skulls game. Uh, I'll make sure you get all the merchandise you need. Awesome, yeah, man. That's very cool. And uh, you have you have two Sugar Skulls fans here already, and I'm sure as as honest and and loyal as Raider Nation is, they will now start following you. And just amazing work, and, and I hope it works out, and I hope you get those discussions. We're going to see Bedane tomorrow at the groundbreaking. Here are their headquarters, so we are going to prime him for information and let you know. So, Ali Farhang, thanks again for joining us today. Well, please send my regards to Mark Bedane and tell him that uh, I'm a hell of a guy. <laughs> and uh, Thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate everything. Have a great Sunday. All right, All right. you too. You Thank you. Too. Ollie Farhang out of Tucson, Arizona. He wants to bring the Raiders. I like his pitch yeah, uh, to Tucson for 2019. We're going to step aside. We'll be back here on the Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. The law office of Michael A. Tr
1140. This portion of Silver and Black today is powered by the law office of Michael Troiano. Hey, this is Tim Brown, Hall of Famer. You're listening to Silver and Black today. Welcome back on this football Sunday with the Chargers getting set to take on the Patriots in a chilly, chilly Boston in New England. Uh, welcome back. I'm Scott Branson, joined by Matt Gutierrez, my co-host, as always. And now we go out again. We're going to talk about yesterday's Dallas Cowboy Los Angeles Rams game uh, with our good friend Vinny Bonsignore from The Athletic in Los Angeles. Vinny, it was quite a game, uh, and uh, it, the scoreboard looks close, and the score might have been at times, but boy, those uh, offense and the defensive line of the Rams really dominated and showed what they could do. Uh, uh, just a great game for uh, for uh, McVay and his team. Yeah, no question about it. And you know, it got a little dicey there at the end, but uh, you know, I think when they went up, I think it was twenty three seven was the largest margin. I think that, uh, and then when they got the, you know, the punch it in on fourth and goal to go back up by uh, eleven, um, you know, I think that. There was a huge sigh of relief, and, and it was an impressive win, but it was how they won. They manned up, were more physical than a team that a lot of people thought were going to be more physical than they were, uh, but they accepted that challenge. You know, I think there's a little bit of a misconception. You know, you, you score 30-some-odd points a game. Uh, you know, the, the, the narrative is that they're all there must be throwing the ball around the yard, but this has been a running team all year. They're the third, you know, uh, most rushing yards in the NFL. Uh, and, and they did something that no team did against the Cowboys this year. They accepted that challenge, mm. and they basically ran it right down their throat. 43 carries with 270-some-odd yards. Uh, it was a, a, a really impressive win, and, and the way they did it uh, bodes really well for the Rams moving forward, I believe. And Vinny, I know the Cowboys carry that America's team moniker along with them, but I, I think it's safe to assume that on behalf of most of the country – Thank you for quieting that <laughs> fan base, man. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure most people are happy about that. Um, going going forward now, uh, you, you got past the Cowboys, and, and you have the defending Super Bowl champion today going against the number one seed in the NFC and one of the, one of the coolest places to play in in New Orleans. Are you guys, obviously you want the home game, right? You don't want to have to go to the Dome and deal with that. But at the same time, if, if the Eagles – can go into the dome and win. Now you have to deal with a team with all that swagger again. Nick Foles riding that hot streak doesn't seem to want to lose in the playoffs at all. I, is it just a case of man, just let us stay home? Uh, you know what? Uh, there, obviously, if you you know injected some truth serum uh, into the Rams, <laughs> I think staying home uh, and avoiding having to go to the madhouse that is um, you know uh, New Orleans and and that atmosphere. Um, yeah, uh, that makes a little bit of sense. But I got to tell you that um, I, I also think that there's a part of them that does not mind uh, hooking up again with the Saints. You know, they, they went and played a really great – it was it was a great game uh, when, when we were out there. I can't remember, no, November, October, whatever it was, uh, it all kind of gets to be a blur. But, you know, they fell into a 21-point hole uh, through some of their own doing. There was a key interception that Jared Goff threw uh, towards the end of the second quarter that, that, that put it at 21, you know, they – Saints ended up cashing in, but then they came back, came roaring back to tie it, and were in position to win that game. And there was a miscommunication on a long touchdown pass that Marcus Peters gave up. But other than that, it, afterwards they were like, you know what? We know we could beat this team. Uh, we really believe that. Whether it's here, whether we have to come back here, or whether it's going to be in Los Angeles, we know that we could beat this team. And, and honestly, they kind of look forward to, to maybe having to do it that way. But uh, you're right. You know, if, if uh, the best case scenario is that they don't have to get on an airplane and go to New Orleans and deal with that. But if they do, I think that this team is mentally uh, and physically prepared to do it. Well, listen, uh, Vinny, let, let's talk about, uh, again, one of the things that I love so much about sports is is uh, these human interest stories that come out. It's always about perseverance and all that. C.J. Anderson, of course. Now, Todd <laughs> Gurley, Todd Gurley, best running back in the, in the game, okay? And, and 16 carries, 115 yards, a touchdown. Great game. But then there's yeah. C.J. Anderson, who's been sitting on the pine, uh, and I mean outside of the game, uh, for the entire season, um, comes in 23 carries, 123 yards, two touchdowns. Talk about not only him and what he's been able to do, but what that means to the team to have another guy there to spell Gurley uh, and to really give it that one-two punch. 
Yeah, um, it's huge. And, um, you know, the the C.J. Anderson thing is pretty fascinating to me because it also, everything sort of happened uh, in retrospect when you look back. um, Maybe it was just meant to be because uh, first, you know, Todd gets hurt and he's going to be out a couple of weeks, which was probably a blessing in disguise for him when we look back on it. But at the same time, the Rams were just coming off getting kind of physically beaten by the Eagles and by the Bears. And in talking to people, you know, in the organization, there was a sort of a moment of truth for Sean McVay uh, in that week. And I remember distinctly him saying after that game, we're going to come up with some answers. And I know this about this team. We're going to work hard. We're, get, we're going to come up with those answers. we got to do it fast. And that week, um, in that moment of truth, he figured out we got to do it. We have to figure out a different formula uh, moving forward or at least get back to kind of what we were doing. And they decided at that point, he decided at that point, look, we have to be the most physical team. We have to commit to the run. We have to stay committed to the run. Uh, we have to be the more, you know, just bigger, stronger team. And it just so happened to coincide with them signing C.J. Anderson, who's obviously playing with a chip on his shoulder. And, oh, by the way, it's pretty damn good. <laughs> He's yeah. a good running back, you know, and, and so their mindset changed going into that uh, Arizona Cardinals game and a capable running back who was able to, you know, help execute that. All of a sudden they're running all over the Cardinals and they ran over the, all over the 49ers and people could say, oh, well, it's just the Cardinals and 49ers, but they probably could have thrown the ball all around the yard to beat those two teams. It was how they beat them. They got back on track to who they wanted to be and who they really are. And that carried over into the Dallas game where they, you know, moved a a wall that people didn't think was capable of being moved the way it was and ran all over the Cowboys. And that's who the Rams are now. And that helps Jared Goff because he can operate out of play action in pretty comfortable um, settings in in the pocket. Um, And so all of that travels. To me, all of that travels. A run game travels. A good defense because they've got four physical defensively as well travels. Um, So it's, to me, they're poised. They're in a perfect position, I think, to do what they need to do to to get to that next step. I mean, let's talk about the Coliseum last night, man. We've seen some, I mean, with USC, USC and the Burgundy and Gold in there, we saw back in the 80s with the Silver and Black in there. Last night, with all the talk of Cowboys fans traveling the way that they do, and social media likes to hype it up that they're taking over L.A. and all of that, mm-hmm. man, there was nothing but blue and gold in that stadium, it seemed, and they were waving the towels. Just talk about the atmosphere there last night and what it was like to have that kind of NFL playoff game back in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's 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 pretty big time, and and there's been a couple of great moments at the Coliseum this year. The Chiefs game was just off the hook. Mm-hmm. The Vikings game, that Thursday night game earlier in the season, was a tremendous atmosphere. The Packers game was a tremendous atmosphere. Yeah, there were a lot of Cowboys fans uh, that were there last night. Number one, they travel, but number two, um, you know, maybe people outside of California or Southern California aren't, aren't you know don't realize this, but the Cowboys have a huge foothold here. They spent 1980, 1963 to 1989 practicing in Thousand Oaks, where the Rams now are situated. They right. currently have their training camp in, in Oxnard, which is just, you know, not, not too far away. They've been a fixture in the summers in Thousand Oaks since anyone can remember that's grown up in this area, and that's bred a lot of fans. And, and by the way, in between all of that, there was no team in Los Angeles for 20-some odd years. <laughs> that's so, right. It was a shrewd move. I mean, all of those connections that the Cowboys made over all of those years pay off on a night like last night because a lot of their fans are here That's or right. come, hey. you know, travel out there. But there were more Ram fans than there were Cowboy fans, and and even with the the, the ratio, it was just a great atmosphere. And I think if you're the NFL. Even if that's going to be the case sometimes, where there's going to be a whole bunch of you know other teams fans uh, at Ram games, you will take that atmosphere every Any day. single time. It was oh, of electric. course. And, it's, and you had stars there: LeBron and Rajon Rondo. There were there were Hollywood people out there. There were music industry uh, people out there. It was it was a great great atmosphere, and it's it's great for the NFL. It's obviously great for LA. Yeah, and Vinny, in about the minute and a half we have left, the one thing I want to finish with is. Huge point in the game to me was the Rams leading 23 to 15 to have an eight point uh, a lead after the Cowboys go down and score. They then come out on a long drive. Jared Goff leads them all the way down. Uh, they get down to uh, the, the red zone. They're, they're fourth and one. They can kick the field goal, go up by two possessions. Sean McVay goes for it on fourth and goal. I mean, is there anybody, and everybody in the Southwest will get this, is there anybody with Mark Cajones right now in the <laughs> NFL? Then Sean McVay and talk about in the locker room what that means to those guys that play for him. 
Yeah, and, you know, it, it, it kind of backs up some of what Sean says to this team, and that's, you know, let's play fearless. Let's not be afraid of moments. Let's not be afraid to do what we have to do in order to win a football game. And he creates that confidence. And I could tell you, there was a lot of guys that I talked to last night that, you know, it was kind of like, you know, off the side talking and stuff. Like, look, look people might be surprised by what we did tonight or how we did it. We knew that we could do it. They, we, we saw this on film. We knew that, you know, uh, this is not a shock. It's not a surprise. But those two fourth down plays, one, they get the stop on fourth down uh, to get the ball, and then they, they, they go down the field and, 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 and punch it in. C.J. punches it in on a fourth and goal when they could have easily, like you said, taken the field goal. But, but embracing big moments like that and executing in big moments like that, it's just it's, it's what they the do. confidence level is just incredible. Vinny, all right, man. Well, listen, uh, have fun with the championship game wherever it may be, and we'll talk to you right after that, I'm sure. Thanks for joining us. All right, have a good one, guys. All right, Vinny Bonsignore on the Rams' big win last night. You're listening to Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. We're here with Chuck, founder of Dollar Law.
CBS Sports Radio. This portion of Silver and Black today is powered by the law office of Michael Troiano. This is Silver and Black Today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Here's your host, Scott Gulbranson. Welcome back. Hunter Henry is active Yay. for the Chargers. His season debut in the He's biggest been game of the all year. year, hasn't he? Stephen A. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you brought up the Stephen A stuff. Yeah, man. That, that's Taking pretty funny. shots over here. Uh, yeah, but uh, it, it'll be interesting. That game will be fun, uh, and we'll, we'll see. <laughs> We'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, Ollie Farhang from Tucson, great. man. I know before we get to your your uh, no man, he's audible. awesome. I love that. Man. Yeah, and he actually already texted me a link to their merchandise. So because we talked about his Sugar Skulls team, dude, which that, is in logo, the IFL. that logo's awesome. You said IFL, it's called now, right? There. I didn't realize so the in, Arena League fell apart. Indoor football, the Arena League is still around with its four teams. I think the <laughs> Philadelphia Soul, which Ron Jaworski, Bon Jovi, bon Jovi yeah, too. Ron yeah. Jaworski and Bon Jovi are, are owners in. It's, I, win it every year it feels like now i mean it's a, it's a four-team league there's not much going on anymore but the the perennial powerhouse of the league which was the arizona rattlers they jumped ship a couple of years ago and they're now in wow. the the indoor football league the ifl and that's the league that the uh, the sugar skulls are going to be a part of now they've got uh what 12 teams or so of in course the, league. the the arizona rattlers where uh long time danny danny white the long time dallas cowboy coach and of course hunky cooper hunky yeah the unlv wide receiver was there forever won championships with them playing and coaching so very interesting but i, I Iowa like that barnstormers discussion. uh kurt warner's I, kurt warner's former Ford. afl team yeah, he yeah. they are also in the ifl that's right so uh but fun stuff and and i you know i don't know if there's any chance of it happening but I like their their sell, and it makes sense because, to your point, it's not an NFL market. Okay, Matt. So, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, uh, I was just gonna say my uh, my high school quarterback grew up great friends, still friends to this day. He just texted me the other day because he's a big Chiefs fan. He said, "Finally, they got the win." He played for the Iowa Barnstormers for oh, a few years. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Even right. even had a jersey online, man. It's pretty cool. All right, now we're going to Matt's audible. Okay, Matt, what are we talking about today? In of course the second hour, third segment, as we always do. Man, we've talked about it a lot already, just because it's been such a big deal, and that's that's these home field advantages that these teams have. If I, man, I wish I wish it would have kept snowing yesterday throughout the course of that Kansas City game, because you would have had that visual like you got with the Raiders and the and the Patriots back in the, the horrific tuck rule days. Uh, <laughs> by the way, Vinatieri, really? Really? <laughs> Charles Woodson, Misses I don't know if you saw the tweet, man. Charles Woodson said now he wants to miss a game, miss a field goal in the cold. I know, I know, exactly. I, mean, I saw that. that come was on, funny. dude, what are you doing, Adam? But uh, these these home field advantages, they're obviously, they're a big deal, right? I mean, not everybody's going to win at home, but they're a big deal. And I'm watching, I'm watching that snow early on yesterday and thinking about what kind of, effect the weather has on these games versus a team like new orleans who is the number one seed in the playoffs the best record in, in the nfl this year and the way that they play in that dome versus playing anywhere else it, it's it's next level but you have places like seattle where they built that stadium for sound right i mean i've, I've been oh, to yeah. seattle i've i've heard the sound in there it, it's legit it gets loud i've been to arrowhead it gets loud both of those stadiums, you do have have weather factors. I think Kansas City a little more than Seattle because Seattle, Seattle's weather is is funny. I don't think it's as as bad as everybody makes it out to be. Although it is it is wet there a lot. It's it's not like getting that those crazy winter storms that you get in these other places. Green Bay is another one that oh, comes yeah. to mind. Yeah, um, the, you know, I mean, they're a big one. And then New England, New England, I think very much a product of that team has just been so great for such a long time. And, and you know, you can go back to that, that tuck rule game where you had the snow, but outside of flurries and things like that, you haven't had anything like that since. You've just had the cold. My question is, where would you rather be? Because the Raiders are coming to town here, and they're going to have an indoor stadium. Granted, it will open up on the sides, on the end zones. You'll have those big windows that open up, um, kind of like you see in, in, in like Milwaukee when they keep the roof closed, but the – the windows are open up for baseball. A little, little different style there. But they're going to have that indoor home field advantage now. What would you rather have? Because in the weather, you got to deal with that no matter what you are. The home team, road team, you've got to deal with the weather. When you've got the noise, when you've got that dome on your side, when you've got the crowd behind you, that only affects one team negatively, and that's the team on the road. No, I agree. And I think... You know, there's, there's always been a lot said about warm weather teams going to the cold and dome teams. I'm looking here. Dome teams are 4-23 and 23 in the playoffs when they play outdoors and it's colder than 35 degrees. 
So I think there's something to that. It's just because if you if you play in it more often, you're just going to be more acclimated to it. But I, I agree. I think that indoor, although, like you said, Seattle is pretty much outdoor. Now it's got the big coverings on the side of the stadium, mm -hmm. which I'm sure acoustically keep the sound in a little more. So to me, um, yes, I, I think always home field advantage is big. I don't care where you're at. Uh, when you put it in a dome and you and and you look at historically, for example, if the Rams have to go down to New Orleans, it's a tough. I don't I don't care how good the Rams are. I think they could still win, of course, but it's just tough. It, it you have environments where the fan base shows out. They're loud. They're very good, and I think that's why, as great as it's been in the Oakland Coliseum for Raiders, when they get here into that indoor facility where it's going to be loud and that that composite ceilings bouncing the sound back down on the field. It's going to be pretty insane. Yeah, you think they're not going to build that place to acoustically give the Raiders a huge advantage? And, you know, we, we've, we've been over this a thousand times. It's, it's unfortunate that they have to leave Oakland. That's their home, right? We, we all know that. Feel bad for the fan base out there. But this stadium for the Raiders is going to be next level as far as home field goes. Everybody, the naysayers out there, we know, we know how the haters are with Raider Nation, but... <laughs> think that it's going to be 90% road fans, which I still I can't wrap my head around that that way of thinking because the Raiders travel as well as anybody and they they sell out they sell out games as the road team taking over stadiums. Why would they not sell out you, you know, their home stadium? Matt, it, you, it doesn't make sense. You know this and you're, you're wearing your your uh, gold night stuff today, your gear. It's, it's the same reason. It's because people don't understand the Las Vegas right. market, so they jump to this conclusion. And that's the point. If, if, if the Raiders can make it into the playoffs, which is the big question at this point, <laughs> uh, even when they get in the new stadium, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think you're going to have to worry about any of that because with L.A. fans, Oakland fans, everybody from even Southern – we were up in Southern Utah yesterday, and, again, in the grocery store, in the Target, Raiders gear next, right next to BYU and – Utah and Southern Utah and the stuff It almost doesn't match, right? No, Raiders it doesn't gear match. next to BYU totally gear. <laughs> it totally <laughs> sticks out. It's kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. But there. you're going to draw in fans. So, so I don't think that's good. But, but today, for example, I think the Eagles, as hot as they are, I think they're going to hit a brick wall going in New Orleans for the same reason you're saying. Yeah, and last year last year with, with the Eagles, and, and, and I think with certain stadiums, home field advantage is based more on just the fact that they, they've got a great fan base that, that gets behind them like you had with the Eagles last year and they're wearing the dog masks and things like that. Um, Philly is a cold weather stadium, but it, it doesn't always seem to play into it the same way that other places do. Um, again, like the Green Bays in Kansas City where you get these snowstorms that are just nuts that roll through. <laughs> Midwest is insane cold. I don't know how anybody lives there. But I think I think the dome I think the dome is is I didn't I never thought I would like indoor football. I gotta be honest with you. And I don't mean the IFL like we're talking about or the Arena Football League. Talking about the Dome stadiums, 2016 was the first time I went to an indoor stadium. It was in New Orleans. Raiders opened up there. You remember the fourth down? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the touchdown and the two-point conversion to win the game, right? I couldn't believe how amazing the atmosphere was in there. And it's not just in-game. Before the game, you get the light show. You don't get that outdoor, right? You don't. Yeah, it, yeah. When it's a one o'clock. It's kickoff, a different experience. You yeah. don't get a light show. You right. had the light show. Uh, you, you, had, you had the noise, the way that it, it, it's trapped in there. Man, the, Raider, the Raiders are going to have an aspect of that. Now, you're going to get natural light filtered in, right? The way the stadium is designed, oh, yeah. you have natural light coming in through this roof, which is, is a really cool idea, especially when you got the strip out there and that, that whole end of the stadium is going to open up and the, the views are going to be amazing. But you're indoors. You're still going to be able to control that environment in a different way. And I just I feel, I feel like a lot of times it's, it's more advantageous for the home team to have the noise and the crowd behind them in a dome style setting versus having the weather behind them because again both teams have to deal with the weather well and, and yeah they do and and, and next week for example a, a kansas city is going to host the afc championship game uh, against either the chargers or the patriots it's going to be bitterly cold yeah. now they had all that snow i don't know what the forecast says for precipitation next week but it's going to be cold versus if it's in new orleans or la that's going to be a warm weather game for either team uh but from a from a pure contest standpoint matt if you look at both of those games and what we're looking at for possibly the AFC Championship game. If the Chargers can get through now, we David Stepani and our engineer here told us uh, the teams that win nine straight on the road or, or more have won the Super Bowl every time. So, so if the Chargers can get past the Chiefs, you got to like their chances no matter how how they play. But the Rams will have had to go through, I think, New Orleans or beat the Eagles at home. That's going to be a tough one. Mm -hmm. So either way. 
these are shaping up. I'm telling you, this, this, the AFC and NFC championship games are shaping up to be, I think, two of the best games we've seen in a long time. Let's assume New Orleans wins today. Mm -hmm. AFC championship game is in Kansas City. NFC championship game is in New Orleans. Who would you rather be? Which well, stadium would you rather be in to see those games? I don't care who their opponents are. Uh, Which stadium would you rather be at to watch that game? I'd have to say Arrowhead. Really? Yeah. I've been to both, man. Because it's cold as heck out, and you I have like to drink New Orleans, there. dude. I don't know. <laughs> I like. I've been to both. They're both great, man. It's fun times. Um, yes. Although I did have some trouble when I was at Arrowhead last time. Anyway, <laughs> uh, when we come back, we're going to talk a little about the NFL draft. Today is the deadline for college players to declare for the NFL draft. How will that will affect the Raiders? We'll take a look. You're listening to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 11:40 a.m. Join CBS.
1140. This is Cliff Branch, former of the Oakland Raiders, three-time Super Bowl champ, four-time Pro Bowl, and you listen to the Silver and Black Show. Indeed you are. Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 a.m. in Las Vegas. As we think about uh, what's happening, of course, we had more coaching changes. Cliff Klingsbury in Arizona. We had Adam Gase, which is the biggest huh uh, of all time, going laugh, to the Jets. Man. The Jets just cannot get out. In if a, in if a, year, a team you play twice a year has a coach that <laughs> is inept and can't seem to get things go done, go why, higher. Why, why would you bring him in? Why? Because he beat you guys once in a oh, while? Oh, boy. It's just unbelievable. Oh, okay. That's the one. Jeet's going to jeet. That's the even that's even bigger than the Clingsbury thing, which actually I think is going to work out. I know I'm in the minority when I say that, but I think it will. All right. So what we're going to talk about this last segment, um, uh, Matt, is a little bit about the draft because today the 13th is the last day that um, college players can declare for the NFL draft to say, hey, I'm not coming back. Um, and of course, there's some guys that are out there that could change the overall look of the draft if they come out. Three guys who could declare all from Alabama who could shake things up a little bit. Mac Wilson, the linebacker, Herb Smith, the tight end, and uh, Deontay Thomas, of course, a safety at Alabama. All guys uh, that would actually fit nicely with the Raiders at some point. Uh, but the one guy, Matt, that could turn the whole draft, I think, around in, in many ways, not just from a picks perspective, but from a trade perspective, is Kyler Murray. We continue to see even more increasing speculation that M Murray will actually go football versus baseball, meaning he'd have to pay back his $4.66 million to the Oakland A's. So the question is, why, sh why would he play football and why should or shouldn't he? Man, if I have, if I have the option, I, look, I love football. I loved playing football. Uh, I loved everything about the game, the physicality of it, hitting people, all of it. it it's great. But if you can play baseball professionally, if that is an option for you, why not do that? I mean, it just the longevity of the sport is is so much greater than what you get out of football. Um, the the money is guaranteed. There's no salary cap in baseball. It just it, your body is not going to go through the ridiculous wear and tear that you get out of football. Right. Now, who knows? Maybe he enjoys playing baseball because he's really good at it and loves playing football, and that's why he's doing it, well, if he decides to make that decision. And I, and I think you're right. I mean, you mentioned, in the, and I wrote down my list here when I was considering this, is why he shouldn't, right? Health, you mentioned that. Longevity, again, same thing. Guaranteed contracts. Baseball has them, football doesn't, unless he goes in the top five. So the big caveat there is, if he goes in the top five of the NFL draft, he's pretty much guaranteed $30 million, okay? So that's the one thing to consider. If he goes low in the first round, that's about nine and a half million. You got to pay four and a half back to the A's. Then you're kind of like even money there. Why would you do that? So it's it's kind of a wash. To me, the reason why he should do it, I think w number one is what you mentioned, and that is you love the game. Number two, mm -hmm. money. If you're a franchise quarterback and you have a long career, that's avoiding serious. That's a big if, but there are lots of ifs, including in baseball. If you look at all of the current franchise quarterbacks that, you know, the Aaron Rodgers, the, 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 the Brady's, all these guys who've avoided those serious injuries, as they head towards retirement, they have about $150 million in earnings in the course of their career. Huge, right? Right. So, so even though $4.66 million for baseball is a nice chunk of change, uh, it would be the only big payday that, that Murray's going to have in the next five or six years because he's, if you look at how he's projected in Major League Baseball, it's going to take him a while to get there. And then, so if you, if you say, okay, $4.66 million, Matt, for baseball, I go play baseball. Look at the the journeyman quarterbacks in the NFL. Now these are journeymen, first right. rounders. Mark Sanchez, seventy four million dollars he's made. Matt Castle, sixty five million. Fitzpatrick, fifty eight. Josh McCown, forty nine. Mike Glennon, twenty eight million dollars. <laughs> right. So so if he's a first round and he is the first, and and if there's indications that you're going to be a top five pick, which I think if he does come out, he would be. Right. Then. I think you got to do football. I agree, and if that's and it, but it's a gamble, right? You you have to absolutely. take that gamble. If you're absolutely. if you're going to be that guy, then absolutely, you love playing football. You can make that kind of money right away. Then you 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 can absolutely do that. Baseball, if if you're a top prospect and you're going to be a guy that is not a you know a triple A guy that's up and down, you're a perennial MLBer. You're there all the time. You you 
you are a 162 game a season ball player in the long run you're going to make a ton more there but that's not a guarantee well, there's a reason there's a thousand minor leagues right in baseball right. i mean there are players everywhere just trying to make it to the so, show so yeah so you get 4.66 million dollars in the next for the four years you're riding the bus eating taco bell right now yeah now, exactly again though that doesn't mean that it's not a good thing but if he's the first quarterback taken, which he would be, in my view, if he comes out, if Tyler Murray comes out, he is the first. The Cardinals have the first pick. What did they do last year? They drafted a quarterback. Right. But there's been a lot floated this week that the Cardinals could actually, if Murray comes out, take him. Because Cl- Cliff Clingsbury loves him. He's, he said a lot of positive things about him. And, and, and even though I think Josh Rosen's going to be a very good NFL quarterback, imagine if the Cardinals were to take Murray and then trade Rosen. So, so you have an amazing opportunity to rebuild your team there by taking quarterback. Now, a lot of people don't think of the draft. You take what you need, but sometimes you take a piece that can get you more. And I think there's a possibility to do that. You have Haskins coming out. You have Kyler Murray, of course. You have Drew Locke, Daniel Jones, Will Greer. These guys come out, and I think the Raiders can play here. They're in the top four picks. So if somebody really wants a quarterback and Kyler Murray comes out and there's a run at quarterbacks at the top of the draft, the Raiders could pop down a couple spots, still get a defensive Man, player they, they need. I, I, I honestly, I hope they don't. I think they've, I think they've stocked up enough, uh, enough equity in this draft <laughs> and the next draft. I hear you. That they don't need to start making moves to acquire more draft picks. Uh, I mean, they, they just, they need to go in here with, with a plan, with a mindset, with a mentality that we, these are our guys. That's, it's one thing I go back to with the 20, the 2014 draft when, their draft board, 1-2, was Khalil Mack, Derek Carr. That was their draft board. And they got those two guys in that order exactly how they wanted to. And, and it worked out well for them. Those two developed, and they, they made the playoff run in 2016. I think if you start moving around too much, you, you start to lose out on the guys that you really wanted originally because once, once that fluidity happens, you don't know how the draft is going to shake out. All of a sudden, not that you know anyways, but right. there, there's an the idea. Only, there's a blueprint. Things can change I, too I, quickly. And I, you might lose the guy. I totally agree. You take on increased risk. Although, if if he comes out, if Murray comes out, and the top of that draft changes significantly, and some of these other guys, the guys I mentioned from Alabama, come out, then what you could see is you could see the Raiders if they drop a spot or two. Right. They could stay, and and it, to me, it's less right now. Dropping five or six spots, no, I I, I would completely disagree with that. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to be fa- – I think this draft uh, is shaping up to be fantastic. Are we going? We should go. I, I, I think we I should be there, Scott. Well, either way, we're going to cover it uh, in depth here at uh, CBS Sports Radio. I always wanted to go to Nashville. Yes. Go. Nashville's fun, man. It's, it's heard, a blast. I've heard great things. All right. Well, we're coming up on the end of the show, Raider Nation. Make sure you stay tuned with us. Uh, watch Twitter, Silver Black, the number two day. Silver Black Today on Twitter. Silverandblacktoday.com, of course, is the website. Matt? We'll talk to you next week. Yeah, man. Can't wait. Let's do it. All right. You have been listening to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio. We will see you guys next week. Again, uh, make sure you uh, download the podcast. Sunday. Championship Sunday. That's right. Make sure you check out, uh, download, subscribe, YouTube, and to the podcast and radio show over on iTunes. We'll talk to you next time. See you later.